Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 72 of the Be Yourself and Love It podcast. Back with me today is Lauren Lockman from the Tanglewood Wellness Center in Costa Rica. Thanks for rejoining me, Lauren. It's good to speak to you again. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Great. So we had a really great conversation last time and it seemed like we were just beginning to scratch the surface. And I forgot to say in my introduction that one thing I really love about your YouTube channel is as I watch more, as I watched more, I saw what I saw emerging was a full account of a, a vision of human health or a, an account of the way that human health works. And it was a par- what you're sharing is basically a paradigm of natural living in harmony right. with nature, exactly. eating, the, eating the right foods that suit this organism, that suit the body that we we are, and and what the benefits of that are. And uh, so we we can dig a little bit into that today, maybe. I think that sure. would be quite fun. Yeah, sure, be glad to. So it might shock people to know or it might not shock people to know, that you're actually a raw vegan. Uh, Not only that, but you mostly just subsist off fruits and certain vegetables that, well, that are actually fruits, but people think are vegetables, as well as salads. Um, And could you tell people some of the value of that? What you think the value of the sort of raw um, fruits and salads and cucumbers, tomatoes, avocados, um, what is the value of this diet? Well, um, that, that's, a, that's a, an easy question and a difficult question. It's a difficult question because the answer is so huge. Um, the way I like to, to explain this, though, if you were to look at a continuum of all possible diet choices, okay, you know, imagine a line, and at one, one end you have the worst possible diet, theoretically, whatever that might be, I would suggest maybe nothing but McDonald's. <laughs> right. Um, Right at the other end, you would have uh, the diet that I'm proposing, which I believe, you know, that's, that's what I would say is at the other end, the optimal raw vegan diet. Why a raw vegan diet? Um, okay, so let me, let me say that probably at least the top third of all the diets, all the points on that continuum, right? And there's an infinite number, but a third of, of everything on that continuum probably contains all the nutrients that humans need. Now, if you're at the other end, if you're eating all the McDonald's, you're probably going to be deficient in various things. Um, and, and you will likely have, I mean, some things you'll have a surplus of, like cancer and heart disease, but other things you'll be deficient in, like vitamins and nutrients. Um, right. that, but, you know, the top third of the continuum, probably all of those diets contain everything we need. The difference between the best diet and the second best diet is the best diet contains everything we need. In, in adequate quantity and adequate, not um, an overabundance, because we don't want to consume more than we need to, to get what we need. Right, we don't, well, one is a, as, as a strong term. Some of us may enjoy going out and eat, eating really- No, of, of really course. Want to do it. I guess what you're saying is it's not optimal for us, or at least the body doesn't want us to consume more that, that's that's right. From the standpoint of creating an amazingly high level of health and vitality, it's in no way useful to us to take in more than we need to to get what we want. And, and let me clarify: to get we, what we need. So, if let's say we need uh, ten micrograms of some particular nutrient, whatever it is, we might have to consume twenty or thirty or 40 to actually absorb right, 10. Right. But, if, but if, if, we, if we can get what we need consuming 40, it doesn't, make, it doesn't help us to consume 80. Right. Now we've got excess stuff in the body the body needs to get rid of. Okay, so the optimal diet is gonna give the body everything it needs to meet all of its needs as well as possible in adequate supply, and it's not going to include anything which is harmful to the body. And every other diet, below that point. While they may also give the body everything they need, they're also including things that the body doesn't want. Now this, you know, this is surprising to most people. Most people can't imagine, well, what's, you know, we've been eating cooked food forever. What's wrong, what's wrong with cooking food? And yet 
the science is actually fairly clear if you're willing to look at it. Um, when you cook food, you create chemical changes, and that results in the creation of toxic compounds that never existed until we created them by cooking. In fact, if you look at the course catalog, go to any online culinary, you know, uh, real, doesn't have to be online, go to any culinary academy, there's, there's probably one uh, where you are, and look at their course catalog online. You will see a series of courses called food chemistry or the chemistry of cooking or something like that because you're creating chemical reactions. So I'll tell you a quick story. About 20 years ago, uh, roughly, I was on my way to Stockholm, Sweden, for the first time to speak. And about a month before I left, there was I, I do my best to keep abreast of all of the nutritional research that's happening. And I came across a study that had just been published in Stockholm. And it was interesting because scientists there wanted to determine what was the increased risk of cancer for people working with a known carcinogenic compound. So it was a manufacturing process that where they were handling something called acrylamide, which is, it sounds like acrylic, it's a type of plastic, and it's known to be carcinogenic. And so, you know, if you look at people that are working with, with carcinogenic substances and handling them, for instance, um, migrant farm workers who are, you know, being covered with pesticides as they work, they wind up with high rates of cancer, okay? It's unconscionable that people are working in those conditions, but that, because that's what happens. So they figured these people working with this carcinogenic substance are going to wind up with higher rates of cancer. And they set out to determine what was the increased risk of cancer for these people. And what they determined was there wasn't one, which made no sense. How could they work with this, ch this chemical every day and not have higher risk of cancer, higher rates of cancer? So they set out to try to figure out why. And it took them a while, but what they figured out was these people did not have an elevated risk of cancer beyond the rest of the population because the entire population was eating acrylamide several times a day. Oh, wow. Why would anybody eat acrylamide? Would you ever eat acrylamide? I wouldn't choose to. I wouldn't go out my way to. I don't order at restaurants. No? Yeah, I'll have the large serving of acrylamide, please. <laughs> Medium rare. Um, right. People don't, people don't eat it on purpose. But if you've ever eaten, I'll bet you've eaten some. Mm. Because if you've, ever, if you've ever eaten bread or pasta yeah. or potatoes or corn or veg, cooked vegetables, any kind type of grain, cereals, when you cook carbohydrates, you form acrylamide. It's right. formed in the cooking process. And so many years ago, there was a, about 150 years ago now, I think roughly, there was a scientist named Paul Kuchikoff. And Kuchikoff wanted to, to turn, well, so there's a, there's a process called leukocytosis. Have you heard of it? It's a new one on me. Okay, so leukocytes are white blood cells. And leukocytosis is is the name for what happens when you injure yourself. If you cut yourself or bruise yourself or injure yourself in any way, your virtually infinitely intelligent body creates leukocytes in the bone marrow and sends them to the site of injury. And the white blood cells are part of the body's immune system, right? It's, it's, it's like the immune system's foot soldiers. So the white blood cells go in and they clean things up and they help the body heal. And science and medicine agree that leukocytosis only happens in the event of an injury because your incredibly intelligent, virtually infinitely intelligent body is not going to put all this energy into making and marshalling leukocytes for no reason, right? Right. So leukocytosis, leukocytosis only happens in the event of an injury with the exception of digestive leukocytosis. Right. When you eat food, your body sends white blood cells to your digestive tract, and that, we're told, happens for no reason. Right. What? Does that make any sense? Does anything happen for no reason in the body? Of course not. So Paul Kuchikov said, well, that's kind of stupid. Why would the body put all this energy for no reason? And so he designed a simple experiment where he took human subjects and at two different times gave the same people the same food, both cooked and raw. And what he found was that digestive leukocytosis only occurs 
in the presence of cooked food. Right. Okay, so the, that's, that's fascinating evidence. And I, I feel like I, I first came across this idea many years ago in a documentary called Food Matters, but they said as long as you had at least half of your food raw in a meal that you, you, you wouldn't have an immune system response. I, I don't know if that's actually true. Yeah, I don't know if that's actually true either. I don't think so. But okay. even if it is, Let's pretend it's true. Maybe it is true. I mean, my experience and the experience of other people who actually get their body clean and then go and eat relatively, you know, conservative, like things that most people would agree, that's really healthy yeah. food, brown rice and beans or steamed vegetables. Yeah. Someone with a clean body who eats that food feels the difference right away. Yeah, they'll feel sluggish afterwards. They'll feel okay. sluggish. Body temperature goes up. There's there's mucus produced. There's there's your body is reacting, and it's reacting when you eat cooked food as if it's been poisoned, but right. only because but only because it has. Okay. But so now, but here and it, but like if I if I can, Anthony, let me just jump back good. in because the, here's the thing: even if eating. And what they said, you know, what they say is you eat a bunch of raw food first and then you eat the cooked food and there's no leukocytosis. But, but understand that leukocytosis occurs with cooked food because your body is responding to the presence of toxic right. chemicals. Don't you want the immune system right. to do what it needs to do? So fooling the, immu fooling the body into yeah. not reacting in a healthy way, that doesn't make sense. This, yeah, is, this is nonsense yeah. justification. Exactly. Yeah. You know, th these are people going, oh, no, I can make my body not respond, so it's okay. No, it's not. You're actually poisoning yourself. Right. So there's a few things that we can touch upon there, because one thing uh, uh, strikes me is that a lot of foods that we have come to see as healthy, um, people cook them because they can't get the nutrients out of them unless they cook them. Um, and you would right. shock our parents by telling them that, you know, Steve, that the broccoli they had to force us to eat and um, the potatoes that they forced us to eat and maybe even the sprout, uh, Brussels sprouts uh, aren't actually healthy. And they were, they were forcing us to eat them because they, were, cause, cause they believed that they were good for us. So can you, can you talk a little bit about the kind of foods that you've said that people think are healthy, but you would say they're not part of the uh, optimal diet and you know why, why we eat them. Right, well let's, let's back up for just a second and take a, a wider view, okay? Because we're not alone on the planet. There, it's, it's estimated there are approximately 25 million animal species, most of them are insects. Um, but what, what, one of the things that they have in common is, I mean all, all uh, life, you know, all, all animals, as opposed to vegetables and minerals, have a central nervous system, right? They, they live, etc. cetera. Um, you know, they, it's, we're different from plants. And what each of these species has in common is they each have a natural diet. And the natural diet for each species is something that they can easily obtain in their natural habitat without needing a stove to be able to eat it or a juicer or any other machine. They can just walk out into their environment around them and find, you know, acquire and consume whatever it is they're intended to eat. And people say, well, no, this is good food. I mean, yes, you have to cook it, but it's good food. But, but how's that possible? How's mm -hmm. it possible that we need to have machines and, and you know, tools to be able to eat the food that our bodies were intended for? Okay, I, I think that's absurd. We don't need to do that. Now, so there's two questions. One is, you know, do we need to eat those things? And second one is, is it good for us to eat those things? And I've already addressed the second one to some degree, right? Now, let me, let me say that acrylamide is heat dependent. So the more heat that's applied in cooking, the more acrylamide exists. So fried foods are the worst. Mm. Baked foods are pretty bad. Your bread, you know, is not so healthy because it's cooked at a high temperature, steamed and boiled vegetables are cooked at a much lower temperature, about half the temperature that most things are baked at. And so that means they contain less acrylamide. Mm. But how much of a known carcinogen do you want to be consuming every day? Okay. My body is happiest with zero. Right. And, and we don't eat any of this stuff. 
And that's the thing, we don't eat any of it because like every other species, we can get what we need from consuming things that we can consume without needing to process in any way. So broccoli, Bro a broccoli was probably the first superfood that I can remember. I was probably in my teens or 20s when it was declared that broccoli was a superfood. And the reason for that statement, what, what qualifies broccoli as a superfood is that it's loaded with nutrients. And that's wonderful. Uh, being loaded with nutrients is a good thing. Have you ever heard of Fort Knox? Um, yes, I've heard of it. Fort Knox, it's, uh, I understand it's empty these days, but Fort Knox, you know, back in the, in the uh, old days of the U.S. government, um, the U.S. dollar was backed by gold or right. silver. Okay. Yeah. There had to be a certain quantity of gold or silver on hand for every dollar printed, right? Right. Money was actually worth something. And the gold was kept in Fort Knox. So wouldn't it be great if we had a key to Fort Knox? Sure. Right? It would be. It would be because, I mean, we could go there today, but we're not going to get anything out of there because we can't get in. Right. Okay. Right? So being loaded with nutrients doesn't help us if we can't get those nutrients. Right. And you know how bro – go ahead. No, I'm just going to mention that in one of your uh, videos, you shocked – a bunch of new agers by telling them that kale, their precious kale, was useless. Well, had less use to them than a banana because even though it was loaded with nutrients in it, they would get more nutrients out of a banana than kale. And by the way, it's, it's not that kale's useless. Don't get me wrong. Kale is actually very useful. If, let's say, your shoes wear out, you can take some kale and easily sew it together and make a pair of shoes. Okay? Oh. Right. And, and, you know, one of the things I've always said is if you could take a leafy green and make a pair of shoes out of it, it's, it's that dense. It's difficult to digest because what makes these leaves so dense is the presence of cellulose, which is defined as indigestible fiber, and other very complex carbohydrates, these starches, that our bodies don't easily break down. And so, you know, yeah, people think, ah, oh, what wonderful stuff. You maybe you've heard me tell this story before because I, I I told it many times. But you know what happens when I'm traveling and speaking? I often speak at raw vegan restaurants, or I have in the past. And what would happen? Let's say I'm going to be in in your town, um, and I've got I've got a lecture at a raw vegan restaurant if there is one at eight o'clock at you know seven o'clock in the you. evening. Sure, um, I'll come. So at what I would do is we would send a message to our list and say, hey, if you're in that, this area or know anybody who is, uh, I'll be speaking at 7 p.m. and I'm gonna be there at 6 p.m. to have dinner because I like, I like to uh, support the places that are helping me, right? So I'll sure. always eat. If I'm speaking at a restaurant, I'll always eat there, uh, assuming it's a raw vegan restaurant. I've spoken at a couple of non-raw vegan restaurants and I, I don't eat their food. <laughs> but, um, if it's vegan, I'll get a salad. But anyway, I'll, uh, I'll, so I'll, I'll let people know. And it's not unusual for me to be sitting around with a small group of people. Everyone's enjoying their salads. And these days, almost every raw vegan restaurant, their salad is kale. Right. I, can, I can remember when you can go into a raw vegan restaurant and get a salad that had lettuce in it. And today right. they're pretty much all kale because kale's a superfood. Right. And so we're sitting there and we're all eating the salad. And I'll say to everyone, how's your salads? And everyone will say, oh, I love this stuff. It's great. I love kale. And I'll say, how do you feel after you eat it? Oh, not that good. Mm -hmm. Bloated, gassy, etc. It's common. It's common because it's difficult to digest. Right. Now, some people, some people may digest it okay, but the body has to work harder. Right. So you're trying to help people eat food that their body can gain access to the energy and nutrients from in a most effortless fashion. And I have to say when I've been um, mostly raw that I definitely notice a um, sense of ease after eating. And I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more, more about that in a moment. Uh, not too much, but one of the things that you have stressed, I just mean to bring to people's attention is that the, these are high water content foods right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. An apple, an orange, uh, even a banana as compared to say a loaf of bread or meat, cooked meat, is, has got a much higher water content, something like 74% or 73%. That's right. That's right. Uh, 73 to 74%. So, so one of the things is if you want to keep your, so 
Well, actually, I was interested in asking you whether you know if the fact that, that um, the water in that food is going through your digestive tract rather than through your bladder, where I think if you drink, I, I don't know the body that well. Um, I wish they teach us this stuff in school. You'd think they would. You know, it's the most, who knows what their bloody gallbladder does? I mean, you probably do, but a lot of people don't. Do. It's, it's really yeah. ridiculous that, you know, in school they don't teach us what our bo- how our body works. But you're you get you're right. Is there a vector, is there a different vector of rehydration through the digestive tract as opposed to drinking water? Yes, yes, it's different. And uh, what happens, first of all, when we drink water, the water goes into the stomach and then it passes into the small intestine and it's actually absorbed through the wall of the small intestine directly into the bloodstream. Okay. Okay, so let's assume for a second that this glass represents the bloodstream and this water represents my blood Mm -hmm. and that I'm able to drink enough water to double the volume in my bloodstream. I think it'd be difficult to double the volume, but let's say I could do that. Okay, if I can get the water in fast enough, it's absorbed in my bloodstream. Um, What do you think would happen to me if I was able to, to double the volume of liquid in my bloodstream? I don't imagine that would be too healthy. Like double, unless you were dehydrated. Yeah, uh, even if even if I was dehydrated, if, if think about the concentration of electrolytes right. in the bloodstream, if I double the volume, what would happen to the concentration of electrolytes? Yeah, they would half relative. It would to... become it would become half of what it was, and I would become an X person. Right. Okay. It would it would kill me um, because we run on electricity, and if you were to half your electrolytes, you wouldn't survive. Okay. And so when we drink water, if we drink a lot, and I know a lot of people will get up and drink a liter of water, like right, you know, down the whole thing right away. Let's say it takes them five minutes. Well, if you're drinking one liter in five minutes, that's the same pace as if you're drinking six liters in an hour. Okay. One, I'm sorry, 12 liters, 12 liters in an hour. Right, one liter in five minutes is 12 liters an hour. Okay, that's two liters in 10 minutes, 12 liters in an hour. So two healthy, your kidneys, there are two of them, they're constantly filtering your blood. All of your blood is run through your kidneys roughly 60 times per day. It may vary a little bit, but on average 60 times per day, all of your blood is filtered through the kidneys. And your kidneys, two healthy kidneys, theoretically can process up to one liter per hour. Right. If so you're drinking drink water, than, that's we right. We drink more than one liter of fluids per hour. Well, in fact, I would suggest that you shouldn't want drink more than half that much. Okay. Because how do we know if your kidneys are functioning optimally right now or not? What if they're not? Okay, we don't, we don't really know. So I don't want to take any chances with clients. Now, the truth is, if you're living your normal life and you drink a little faster than your body can handle it, it's not the end of the world. You're going to lose some electrolytes. Mm. If, you, if you're drinking faster, your body can process the water through the kidneys. It, what it means is it's just being dumped into the bladder. You're losing it. So you're going to lose some nutrients because our, our body is very intelligent. So as the blood is filtered through, the body recaptures everything it wants from the blood, right? Which means theoretically we keep all the electrolytes. Now I would suggest nothing, including our bodies are a hundred percent efficient. So even if there's a tiny amount of loss over time, it would add up, but in your normal life, you're replacing electrolytes when you eat food. So if, if you don't overdo it too much, you're probably okay. Now I'm working with, uh, you know, all the time for the last 22 plus years, 20, almost 23 years now, I've been guiding people through fast, averaging 26 days. If people are drinking too fast while fasting and not replacing their electrolytes, except with whatever might happen to be in the spring water they're drinking, they are potentially putting themselves in serious danger. Right. But it's, it's, always, it's always detrimental to be drinking faster. I mean, first of all, you know, keep in mind, if you're drinking faster than your body can filter the water, you're losing the water. It's not helping you anyway. 
Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I got really thirsty the last time I fasted. Um, and next time I'll have to adjust my, uh, to make sure that my water intake isn't too high. Well, for most people, it's too low. But the okay. trick is actually knowing how to properly interpret the numbers. Right. The only way to know is, is to properly interpret daily vital signs, something they don't teach doctors or nurses how to do. It's something right. I figured out myself. Honestly, um, and I, you know, I'm happy to say this publicly because fasting is a completely natural process. But did you grow up with fasting in your house? Uh, no. And is, yeah, is there anyone in your community that has any experience with, with long-term fast? Because yeah. the fact is, it's lost to our culture. And so right. virtually everyone is going to do much better having experienced guidance. Yes, of course. And um, you, just to let people know if they want to try a long-term water fast, uh, you of course have the Tanglewood Health Center in Costa Rica, which they can look up and they can check out some of your brilliant YouTubes to get to know you a little bit better first. Absolutely. I want to speak about some fads that are big right now, because obviously you don't just exclude meat and animal products from your diet. You also exclude um, grains and beans and uh, a lot of vegetables, even those that, as we've discussed, that some people have given to thought that are um, healthy. Right now, there's all these other diets that people are taking up and they're saying, they're going paleo or carnivore or high protein, and they're very popular. Not only that, but people, they're also attacking grains, and they're also saying that a lot of vegetables basically don't want to be eaten and have little, um, little toxic chemicals in them that you've talked about in your, there's a, there's a video on YouTube uh, where, where called something like plant defenses or something like that, and uh, yeah. Um, so why is it that people, I, I know I'm, I'm kind of handing you a softball here so you can knock it out of the park, but why is it that people, <laughs> um, some benefits or claim to see some benefits in these diets and um, why might they be wrong to think that just because they see benefits that eating mostly meat is, is right. So, and they, oh, okay. Yeah. It's a, it's a great question. First of all, let's go back to the continuum idea, okay? Um, in fact, I can illustrate this for you if that's helpful. Uh, give me just one second. This will be a rather yes. crude effort here. I don't have a marker or anything, but we'll grab a black pen. Cause and I, yeah, and I should add that, you know, I've heard of people saying that they've had conditions like hay fever disappear on the ketogenic diet and um, in some cases right. worse, worse conditions than that um, recede. Right. Okay. So let, let me, uh, let me give you an example here. Um, all right. So I've, I've got this continuum here. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. And you'll notice that I've marked the, the, the two ends and I've marked a point in the middle. The one yep. over here says, go ahead. I'm just going to mention that most people listen to my show. They don't all watch it. So we might need to okay. speak it to them. Okay. Sure. Thank you. I'll do that. Um, so if you can't see, we've got this, this line. It's a continuum of all possible dietary choices. On one end, you have the, uh, the worst possible diet. That says 3MCD, that's McDonald's three times a day. At the other end, the best possible diet, that's an optimal raw vegan diet. And what I, I've drawn a, a third point here, just about a third of the way up from the bottom. And it's probably too far up. It probably should be closer to the bottom. But that says SAD. That's a standard American diet. You could call it a standard Anglo diet and include the folks on the other side of the pond. It can be a standard any diet because diets pretty much all over the world. And I, I've traveled quite a bit. They're pretty much all the same crap. Right. And they may vary a little bit, but it's, you know, it's, they're all based on the same uh, ridiculous ideas and include things that we can't consume unless they're cooked and processed. Okay. And so um, what you want to understand is that our amazing bodies in every moment of our lives are attempting to take our health to the highest level impossible to the highest level they can. So if you're eating a standard American diet and you move up the continuum just a little bit, hmm. you, let's say you go to a macrobiotic diet. Okay, I am not a fan of macrobiotic diets. Macrobiotic diets came to North America from Japan via Mishio Kushi back in the 70s. And virtually everything's cooked. 
in many cases cooked forever. They're, they literally say, don't eat anything raw, no, no, no fruits, no, no salads, everything is cooked. And, and yet people were often healing from serious conditions. Why? Because it's better than what they were doing before. Right. And, and that's it. You know, if someone's eating a standard American diet or a standard English diet or a standard, you know, Scottish diet, whatever it could be, and they go to a paleo diet where they're excluding all the processed foods, which are crap, complete crap. Okay, you exclude all that garbage from your diet, you're going to be better off than you were before. Does that mean the diet's healthy? No. In many cases, you're going to feel better simply because you've excluded a bunch of stuff. Now, with a, a diet based on animal products like a ketogenic diet or a, a, you know, the carnivore diet, whatever they call it these days, um, and these kinds of fads, by the way, have come around yeah. every X number of years. Yeah. There's, the science is really clear about this. You know, if, aside from the fact that there's all these people out there making claims, the science is clear it's the worst thing you can do for yourself. Uh, practically, I mean, McDonald's is worse, but you know, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. Why so? Will you, will you parse that out a little bit? Why is it so yeah. bad? Yeah, sure, sure. Simply because, you know, again, think about the, the 25 million different animal organisms on the planet. Each of them has a digestive tract specifically adapted for a particular diet. The animals that eat animals have a very different system than we do. Our system is virtually identical to our closest primate relatives, the chimpanzees and bonobos, who live almost exclusively on plant matter, mostly fruit when they can get fruit, uh, leaves, uh, roots, shoots, other soft, tender plant parts when fruit's not available. Mm. And in the heaviest months of, the, of rain in the rainforest where I live, there's less fruit available. So okay. we can get it because we can get it shipped from the other side of the country yeah. where it's raining less. But the chimpanzees, apparently they don't have such good delivery systems. And so they're only eating what's in their local neighborhood. And if there's less fruit, they're forced to eat other things, right? They eat a tiny amount of concentrated protein in the form of insects and, and maybe animals. But the vast majority, 96% of what they're consuming is fruit and, and plant matter. And our systems are just like theirs. Right. Okay. And there, you know, there's, there's various things like we don't have any natural weapons. We don't have claws or big sharp teeth and exactly. um, animals that eat meat, eat meat raw. We can't like just take a carcass and bite through it. But I, I mean, no, that's right. I point out a yeah. couple of things. One is that again, you know, the water content of the meat is going to be lower. And I'm sorry to talk shit, Lauren, but you've mentioned in your videos that our still should be about 75% water. Yeah. So when, whenever you're eating anything that has a lower water content than 75%, you have to drain your system. I would also add that um, we need, is it, I, I believe that we need fiber to push things along and meat doesn't. That, that's, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, the, the fact is there, there are literally dozens of different physiological, uh, anatomical and physiological differences between us and carnivores and omnivores. So let me give you just a few of them. First of all, um, you mentioned biting through the carcass. I mean, consider that the hide of an animal is, is leather, that's what leather is. Right. And, and animal hides are pretty thick. They're not like our skin in most cases, in many cases they're much thicker. We don't have the, the teeth to bite through them. We don't have the jaw strength to bite through them. Try to bite through your shoe and see how you do, okay? It doesn't work very well. Um, in fact, the canine teeth that, that we have here aren't actually canine teeth. You know, if you compare them to the, even the fangs of a kitten who mm. can easily draw blood, Right. Bite down hard on your finger, you're not going to draw any blood, okay? It takes a kitten far less pressure to get blood because their teeth are designed to cut through thick skin. Yours and mine are designed to tear the flesh off of an apple or a pear. Right. Um, our jaws go side to side and up and down because we chew our food. Carnivores' jaws only go up and down because they rip the flesh off the bone and they swallow it whole. We produce only a starch splitting enzyme in our mouth um, because we're eating carbohydrates. That's what we're, our primary diet should be. And if they're not fully ripe, we may have to be able to digest starch. But Lauren, carbohydrate. but Lauren, where'd you get your protein? Right. <laughs> I've never heard that question before. Um, 
That's a joke. I've heard that question all the time. Uh, so this is surprising to most people. But, but first of all, and I, I'd love to share more of the physiological differences. In fact, if you don't mind, let me come back to that question because it's a great question. But let me roll with this. You mentioned something important, needing fiber. Our digestive tracts, on average, are 32 feet long. That's what, roughly nearly 10 meters long. Okay. Right. The digestive tract of a 500 pound tiger is roughly 12 feet long. So it's a little bit more than one third as long as, as yours. Okay. And you're, you're one quarter of its size. Why is that? That's because the digestion of, of meat, of heavy proteins, creates very uh, many toxic byproducts. And so they need to eat their food pass it through their system and eliminate the waste as quickly as possible. And that's why if you've ever had a dog, you feed your dog, right? An hour later, you take it for a walk and there goes the dinner. Yeah. In a well-functioning human body, it takes eight to 12 hours to move that food all the way through the system and eliminate the waste. But because it's spending up to 12 hours in a healthy system and, and up to 96 hours in the average body, it's intended to be completely non-toxic. We're intended to be consuming things only that don't create all these toxic byproducts. And the way it moves through our system is with the presence of ample water and fiber. Now, I'll be honest, carnivores need water just like we do, and they're getting it from their diet because they're eating meat in a way that you and I don't typically do it. When a carnivore, let's say, do you have a uh, wolf uh, foxes maybe up where you live sure we do okay so a fox kills a rabbit and it does so by biting through the juggler vein mm -hmm. okay and and then it drinks all the blood right and then it tears it open and eats the water rich internal organs right and and then it eats the muscle only after all the other stuff and it doesn't cook all the water out of it okay so you know if we were true carnivores we first of all when you saw a bunny rabbit, you wouldn't think, oh, isn't that cute? You would think, damn, that looks like a snack. Right, and right, yeah, yeah. you pounce on it and you'd bite through its juggler vein. And, and people, when they see uh, carcasses by the road, they don't go, oh, I'm salivating. They go, that's so gross, you know? Whereas if you were actually a carnivore, then when you saw a carcass, you'd salivate. You'd want to eat the damn thing. Well, I mean, most animals won't eat something that's been lying by the oh. side of the road for a while. Most I animals eat freshly killed. It's vultures and a few other carrion eaters. But, but, but your point is well taken. You know, again, it's, uh, it was um, T.C. Fry many years ago, the natural hygiene teacher, who said, um, give a baby uh, a, a bunny rabbit and an apple. He said, I'll give you $100 if it, if it plays with the apple and eats the rabbit. Right. You know, right. that's not what we do. We have our natural instinct is to, is to you know, we, we love little cute little animals. Right. That's our natural instinct. It's 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 a demented yeah. mind that wants to injure, harm something. And, and we keep it so far away. You know, I mean, Paul McCartney said if uh, slaughterhouses had glass walls, everyone would be a vegetarian. We try and exactly. put it. We try and hide it as far away from ourselves as possible. And people yeah. who actually work in slaughterhouses have. Um, on average, terrible mental health. It really like damages people to be of course. animals all, all the time. Uh, they have all these uh, terrible conditions as a consequence of working yeah, there. Ex exactly. It's a, it's a terrible, terrible thing. So it's important to understand that our, you know, physiologically, we are quite different than these animals. We do not, we, in fact, gout is a condition where we have excess uric acid in the body. And uric acid is one of the byproducts of protein metabolism. Right. And Animals that are intended to eat animals make an enzyme called uricase. Right. Guess which, guess which uh, species, one of the species that doesn't make any uricase. That's us. Yes. Okay. We're, we're not intended for that. So let's uh, address the protein question quickly because people right. who are listening to this, most of whom aren't vegetarians, uh, might be curious. And I, I'm glad that they tolerate me. Uh, bringing people like you along, along to, to, to and, and they still listen with curiosity, even if they're not converted, because uh, I guess I guess they like something about the show. Um, so, so if they're wondering uh, what's that, uh, what, what is the what is the deal with protein? We keep on being told we need a certain amount of that. That's that's right. Well, so first of all, what you want to understand is that 
Um, we do indeed need protein. It's an essential nutrient. Um, we have to get it. You know, their mac three macronutrients are are carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and we need all of them to some degree. What people don't realize is that, for, first of all, our primary fuel is glucose. Our bodies are set up to run on sugar. Okay, that's what we're, we're sugar burners. Yes, we can adapt. In the absence of sugar, we can run on ketones, which are made from metabolizing fat. But our body um, is is always looking first for glucose because that's our primary and preferred fuel. What people don't realize is that when we're eating the, the plants that our bodies were intended to eat, the cell membrane of every single living cell is made of protein. Right. And the cell nucleus of every single living cell is made of fat. And so when I eat watermelon, I'm getting fat and protein. Not very much, but I don't need very much and neither do you. And what's critically important to explain, to understand, is that it's not just that we don't need a lot of protein. It's been well proven, um, 2013 study showed finally that the, when you eat excess protein, you actually age and die faster. Right, yeah. There's... Okay, and yeah, I mean, this, this is completely proven. There's, uh, we're, we're affecting the telomeres, which are a mirror, you know, basically a, a sign of how much life we have left to eat and the, the, to go. And the more protein we eat, the shorter they become. And by the way, the one thing that's been shown to dramatically re-lengthen them is fasting properly, but let me let me come yeah. let me come back to this idea because it's it's so important, right? To understand, not only do we not need excess protein, it's actually harming us, and um, it, it harms us in many different ways because our bodies are not adapted for this. So we're damaging the liver and kidneys, we're damaging uh, the um, digestive tract, we're damaging the bloodstream. Okay. It's been shown, in fact, that even, you know, you may have heard me say this. And again, this, this is probably not good news for some people. I probably have lost some friends. But nuts and seeds, I've always said, not part of an optimal diet. You know, there, I'm sure there have been times in our evolution where there's been no fresh food, no, no fruits available, no green leaves. Maybe there was a flood or a fire or a drought or a freeze or whatever it might have been. But nuts and seeds intact in their shell they last a long time. They can still be fresh, even when there's nothing else around. And because they're concentrated, we don't need very many. Studies have now shown that eating nuts and seeds damages your uh, blood vessels. Wow. Okay, we, we, we age the blood vessels. And I want to go back to one other piece. You know, every, it's funny that the people who recommend these meat-based di meat diets point to the Inuit, right. commonly called Eskimos, right? And uh, Alaska and Canada, they point to the Maasai in Africa, the Maasai who live only on uh, meat and blood and milk. And they say, look how strong and vibrant they are. Um, not mentioning that they live to an average of 39 years. Wow. Yeah. And, and at 30, I think the men live to 37 or 38 on average and the women a little bit longer. And when they look at the, the blood vessels, of the you know the, the typical man of that maximum age, they look like the blood vessels of seventy-five year old Westerner eating a typical diet. Right. Yeah. You know they're they're not in, they're not in good shape. The Inuit lived only to about forty-two, and they because all they have up there, you know, it's, it's so cold. There's no plants most of the time. They've got meat, blubber, etc. And what they find was that they lived only until their early 40s and they were completely bent over with osteoporosis by that age. Yeah, no question. Yeah, and that's not surprising. And also, you said something about us being able to synthesize protein from amino acids. Well, yes. I mean, in fact, we never need to eat proteins. What we're actually, what their bodies are looking for are the building blocks. And those are the amino acids. And we're getting the amino acids from the fruits and leafy greens that we're eating. And so we never, ever, I mean, I, I haven't eaten animal products in, in 32 years. Mm -hmm. I'm still strong and fit. Um, you know, there's no, no problems whatsoever. And, and by the way, I mean, for those people that can't see me, I'm incredibly good looking. Um, <laughs> no, it's, uh, I, I'm not. Um, but I'm, I'm, in, I'm in amazingly good shape for a guy who's, who's approaching 60. Um, okay. I, I, you know, I wear the same size clothes I wore in high school. I have a 29-inch waist and a 41-inch chest. I'm very strong and fit. I've got more muscle mass than people, most men much bigger than me. 
and right. um, and it, you know, and it's easy to maintain at my age, which isn't supposed to be how it works. Right? It's supposed yeah. to become harder and harder. It's just the mainstream okay. medical paradigm says, well, you know, if something breaks, that's just it. You know, nature is messy. It's evolution. We're imperfect, and you just break down. And yet, you know, I've seen people in India, for example, who practice yoga their whole lives or whatever in the 90s and they're, you know, fit as a whistle. And um, exactly. if you put the right things in, the right things can happen to you. So exactly. as we're getting to the lo- the end of the um, interview, I just wanted to, to mention that obviously you suggest for those of us who have not observed the ideal diet for, the, for most of our lives, one way to detoxify the body or the best way, nature's way, the most efficient way is long-term water fasting. And I guess, uh, first of all, full disclosure, I've not gone the whole hog with the row, or I I have excluded hogs long ago, but (laughs) I've not gone fully raw vegan. For me personally, I think uh, I'd, I'd like to go more and more in that direction, but right now say I will, as you suggest, have a mono fruit meal, one meal, I will just choose a type of fruit that I like and just have a bunch of apples or um, citrus fruit or whatever it is. And I'll have another meal during the day that is like um, red pepper, tomato, cucumber, and avocado, Mm -hmm. for example, like something like Mm -hmm. that. And then I might have a cooked meal for the evening. Uh, So that's far in that direction. And Honestly, you are you are the primary motivation in me to adopt so much more um, raw food into my diet. Um, well, let me let me let me just say something here, if I can, if I can just jump in for a moment, because what I would say to you is, I mean, first of all, congratulations on the changes you've already made. You know, I hope it's clear. Uh, I'm I'm not telling anyone what they need to do. What I'm pointing out to people is that there's a level of health and vitality available to us that is much higher than most people have ever experienced. Most people begin to disintegrate, you know, at a much younger age than they, than anyone needs. So obviously we're all going to die at some point and we're going to have, you know, there is, there is a point at which things will begin to, to go the other direction. But as you can attest, you know, at, at uh, 58 and a half, I have virtually no wrinkles on my face. Um, the, 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 like the women I date are amazed by how soft my, and supple my skin is. Honestly, um, you know, it's, it's, we don't have to age the way people think we do and we can feel and function much better. And if you were ever willing to adopt, even for a month, a 100% raw vegan diet, I can virtually guarantee you that you would feel better than you felt ever, assuming you were doing it correctly. And that's the key is you have to know what to do and what not to do. Right. So, for someone lean like me, if I was to do a long-term fast, um, I mean, I've done 11 and a half days and a lot of people would think that was long-term, but you take people through longer processes so that they can really clean the body out. That's right. And they yeah. can like, um, would I need to put some on some weight or some muscles first? Because I, I did go down pretty to a pretty low weight in my, I put the weight back on, but I went, right. not all of it actually, which I, I'm kind of pleased with because, you know, I was at a certain weight for my whole entire twenties. And then sometime in my early thirties, I went up a lot, um, eight kilograms and got a belly for the first time in my life. So it's like, <laughs> so that's gone. That's gone. Yeah. Right. So what, ha- what happens is, first of all, um, you know, in case you hadn't considered this, uh, anyone listening, if you are, going, uh, and again, our, our average client fast is 26 days, although our clients determine for themselves how long their fast is. People can come here for one week or two weeks or three weeks. And I also, by the way, I work with people via Skype if they can't get here. Um, uh, we book by the week and people can determine how many weeks they want. You know, they can do five days or 11 days or, or 16 days or 21 days. I usually recommend people do a minimum of 21 days because that's absolutely life-changing. It takes 10 to 11 days to get to the deepest part of the process. But there's a couple things to understand. First of all, if you were to fast 21 days, you would lose more than 85% of that weight in the first 14. Right. In fact, if you fasted 11 and a half days, you already lost 80% or more of the weight you would lose in a 21-day fast. It wouldn't go much lower than that because the right. weight loss is always front-loaded. Second of all, how much weight you lose varies depending on how much you have to lose, Mm. how much fat you have. 
So people who are already very lean lose much less than the average. The average person loses 21 pounds, which is just under 10 kilos um, for any metric people listening. And uh, we'll have people, I have a woman here now, the woman who actually, who, who's been producing my videos and doing an outstanding job for the last nine or 10 months. Was a, came to me as a client three years ago, came back about a year and a half ago and never went home. She, she had uh, separated uh, from her husband and is now divorced and decided to stay here and, and as a volunteer. And she's been doing my videos ever since. When she got here the first time, she had undiagnosed type one diabetes, was uh, over five foot seven, uh, 172 centimeters and weighed 40 kilos. 88 pounds. Mm. That's not very much. It's mm. very, very, it's very, very light. Very it's slender. Very, yes. She fasted 21 days and she lost four kilos where the average person loses almost 10. She lost 40%. That's what happens for someone who's super lean. We fast very lean people all the time because often what's happening, there are often people, you look healthy, but there's often people who really are way too thin they're not really healthy they're too lean they can't build muscle they're not putting on healthy weight and that's because there's a problem in their system they're not digesting absorbing or assimilating properly fasting allows us to correct the underlying issue and so these people do fantastically well as a result of fasting and when they're done if they need to gain weight they do now people who need to lose weight don't put the weight back on after it comes off, assuming they keep following the program, the written program that I give them for when they leave here. Well, Lauren, I can't thank you enough for rejoining me. I, I've loved talking to you these two times. And guys, I really recommend you check out some of Lauren's stuff. Um, check out the Tanglewood Wellness Center in Costa Rica. Um, his videos are really fantastic. And you will see as you listen to more and more of Lauren's media that there's an underlying paradigm. It's not just random right. stuff. That yeah. It's a full picture. And that's why it influenced me to change my habits. Whereas, yeah. you know, I've done so much. I've read so many self-help books and uh, done, spoken to experts on the show. But but not all of them influenced me. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, even if you're not ready to go all the way raw vegan, you can definitely include more raw food into your diet and see if you can eat those foods on their own, um, not with heavier foods. Heavier foods might just push them out of the way and you won't. You won't. That, that's right. I mean, go, listen, go to the videos, take a look. There's a lot of great information there. And then if you need some help, I'm available for consultations. I can help you one-on-one -on -one that way. Unfortunately, Anthony, right now, I need to get going. That's um, cool. It's been great to see you again. I'll look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Lovely. Speak again. Thank Take you. Take care. Bye-bye. And you at home, Bye. be yourself. But don't just be yourself. Be yourself and love it.